You know, we say in order for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't always have to be present. Addiction shows up in many different ways. It was just a behavior that came out of a need. And uh, I only discovered what that need was, and I had that need that prompted that behavior through therapy. And I really never knew who I was going to get coming out of the bedroom, if he was going to be happy, or if he was going to be sad, or if he was going to be mad. The depression manifested itself in ways that I didn't expect. We have a lot of different shame responses, and one of them is to deny. As I'm looking at that gun in the mirror, that I freaked out, put it down. It was like a godly, universal wake-up call. I was like, hold, hold on, dude. Yeah. You know, this is not going to be easy. You're going to have to battle, but you're going to get through this. I grew up in a uh, alcoholic family, my dad, and I have this theory, my first job out of college after I got released from playing baseball, I worked at a group home, like an orphanage for boys. And I developed, all my boys were all wards of the court. So their, their parents were either dead, incarcerated, or had probably like molested them. And I had this, developed this theory by working with my boys that people that come from a certain level of dysfunction, I think our eyes are a little different. Like, we just want to be loved and believed in and cared for. Everybody does, but maybe we want it a little bit more and we link achievement to doing that too, I think sometimes. But your upbringing is not all that dissimilar. So just give people context to maybe a little bit about your upbringing, which might explain a little bit of the other parts of your life. Well, I just want to say really quick a response to that because, um, you know, you're being so authentic and vulnerable and your fan base, you know, must obviously respond and relate, uh, which is why they're, you have such a rabid um, fan base. But yeah, I mean, I think if you worked hard for approval when you were young, you work hard the rest of your life. You know, it's kind of, um, I used to look at growing up in an alcoholic home as, you know, I was a victim and poor me. And, you know, I now look back at an alcoholic, just, you know, as you said it, I felt the need to clarify alcoholism. You know, we say in order for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't always have to be present. Addiction shows up in many different ways, where it's a mom that's obsessed with cooking or cleaning, or if it's an obsession with making making Christmas perfect, or if it's a love addiction or a drama addiction or, a, you know, parents fought alcoholism. Sometimes people think that they had to like see a whiskey bottle for alcoholism yeah. to be present. So you saying dysfunction, I think was, you know, important, but um, uh, so that people don't feel like, oh, I think I had chaos, but I didn't. A lot of people yeah. like to minimize their trauma or experience because there wasn't uh, a, a drunk in the house. Yeah. Um, we can be drunk on rage. We can be drunk on control. We can be drunk on uh, perfectionism. We can be drunk on anxiety and all sorts of things. Another person, a behavior, you know, we see it now with social media addiction shows it's, um, you know, uh, we can be addicted to a lot of things besides just actual alcohol. So it, it took me a while to yeah. Understand that because I didn't see a lot of alcohol growing up. Uh, I didn't realize I grew up in an alcoholic home until much later. I just thought my parents fought a lot. I just thought they were, um, you know, uh, like that. I just thought my mom went to bed at six thirty. I, I like I, you know, really? it's, it's a, as a kid, you don't understand what's happening. You know, you and yeah. and and we're amazing. Our brains are amazing. You know, I know you had Dr. Huberman on about um, uh, and talked about uh, brain plasticity. Like we yep. can adapt to a crazy situation very quickly yeah. and we can make up our own narrative about what's happening mom's yeah. tired mom has a headache like what we don't know what alcoholism is when we're yeah. five we believe yeah. our parents they're heroes you know so um but i when you grow up in an alcoholic home or a dysfunctional home you end up having to work a little bit harder uh to get attention you end up having to be funny you end up having mm. to pretend you're sick or pretending you're hurt or mm. taking risks or being loud or all these sort of um uh, maladaptive uh, behaviors. Sometimes they're called character defects. I like to call them superpowers because I, as I get older, I'm like, God, I, I have all these freaking tools and weapons and superpowers that a lot of people don't have. Um, and so I don't know. I'm one of those adversity is good people. That's incredible. You say that I got interviewed on Friday and I said, it, it just occurred to me at almost 50 years old that these are actually, I use the word superpowers of mine. Superpowers. And I think you talk about anxiety. I don't know if you agree with this or not, but like, there's all this notion, like you should avoid all anxiety, avoid all stress. But, and I think there's an element that you should avoid some of it. But also these things are like signals for growth, signals for improvement. They're like catalysts for change too, right? Like I don't want to have a life completely devoid of stress, completely devoid of anxiety. It's kind of like 
I think the contrast of emotions makes life a little bit richer or do you like totally disagree with that? No, I mean, no, we're brats. We're total brats. And mm -hmm. there's this uh, war on anxiety as if it's mm -hmm. something we should get rid of and cure and fix. And yes, there are legitimate anxiety disorders. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I have someone in my family that has a debilitating, can't get out of mm -hmm. bed. Anxiety disorder requires medication. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like this thing of I should never have anxiety, you know, we say in, um, you know, I'm not an AA, I'm an Al-Anon, but in 12-step mm -hmm. programs, we say alcoholics are the only people that believe they deserve to be happy all the time, that they should be having fun all the time. Like that's <laughs> this. And I think we're all like these petulant children now who are like, I should never have anxiety or fear. Yeah. Like anxiety and fear are why our species has prolif have proliferated. It keeps us safe. Anxiety, this is our friend. Anxiety gets us out of bad situations, gets us out of bad relationships. It's our, on one hand, people don't realize how hypocritical they are when they talk about this stuff. They'll be like, trust your gut. I, I, get away my anxiety. It's like, they're the same thing. Your mm. gut anxiety that is your gut speaking to you it's important mm. information you know mm. anxiety motivates us it moves us like you just said um it informs us it tells us whether someone's good for us or bad for us whether we should lean into a situation or lean out of a situation so and also sometimes i think people conflate conflate anxiety and excitement anxiety and nervousness there are a lot of things that we should absolutely be anxious about right now you know, like the, it'd be weird if we weren't mm -hmm. like we'd be numb zombies. Like mm -hmm. um, we have this new petulant thing where we never think we should be uncomfortable. Like it's yeah. a healthy reaction to be anxious about money. Like you should be. If you're not, then you're delusional. That's worse. So mm -hmm. if you have ten dollars, your, if you just overdrafted your bank account, you should feel anxiety. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You right. should, if you don't, then you're delusional. So I would rather ha have anxiety than delusion. <laughs> See, you're the first person I heard say that. It was in an interview I was watching of yours, and I'm like, that's 100% true. But I'm curious, because you're always really, you said, I'm going to be authentic on today's show. And I like to think I am most of the time, too. And And it's weird when it's sometimes when I am vulnerable, because people do come to me for help in these areas, like they do you, too. Sometimes you, you sometimes feel like, I wonder if I'm sharing too much stuff. And but for me, I watched you say something and it hit me because I don't know that I've broken this completely. You said, I think I was almost like unconscious in my 20s, mm -hmm. meaning like, you know, you're and I'll let you explain what you meant by it. But in my version of it is like, I've always just been going. And I thought, you know, I teach people all these tools. I thought, like, am I really over that? Like, am I still as present and as conscious as I could be? And I think a lot of achievers listen to my stuff or at least want to be achievers and they're addicted to this. Yeah. You know, one of the things Huberman probably said on your show too is like, turns out you get more dopamine in the pursuit of something than you do when you achieve it. So this notion that I have to keep getting things. But for me, it was like, if I can get there and then this next one, this next one, this next one. And I look back now and I always want to say to people because I'm one of the older people now in the space, like I wasn't present enough. I did not enjoy the ride as much as I could have. What changed for you if it did in your 30s that you didn't do in your 20s? Uh, um, you know, for me in my 20s, I was unconscious. You know, I was a complete puppet of fear and workaholism. And um, I was a little bit of a zombie. You know, uh, I thought the only thing, uh, you know, I equated, you know, productivity with my self-worth. I derived yeah. my self-esteem from productivity still do just the motives are a little cleaner you know mm -hmm. it was a, it was when i was in my 20s uh i didn't know how to measure twice cut once i was working 10 times as hard not working smart i just wanted to keep busy because i was in pain and mm -hmm. i was so desperate to make it i was so desperate for approval i was so desperate to be loved that i was just a sort of um unconscious like tasmanian devil just like am i this person am i this person you know mm -hmm. um running from whether it was relationship to relationship, from job to job. Um, I also was just grew up without money. I didn't have money. So I was also mm -hmm. just trying to make money. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I think it is, who was it was saying that um, your IQ goes down when you're worried about money. Al, uh, Andrew Yang, who I think you're having on soon. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know who did the study, mm -hmm. not a scientist, but when you're worried about money, your IQ does go down. Um, mm -hmm. So I also wow. was so scared of mon uh, not having money but also at the same time, spending irresponsibly and, um, you know, had a shopping addiction and all that. So I, I, I personally, um, you know, 
I know people are going to make fun of me in the comments. <laughs> I do identify as an addict. I know I say that on every podcast. Mm. I just don't want to be going like, this is just how women are. This is just how, you know, people that grew up in alcohol homes are. Like I, I very much identify, um, as an addict. So I was, I was very addicted to drama. I was in bad relationships. I was cheating. I was recreating my childhood circumstances subconsciously. I was recreating uh, that wow. familiar pain, you know, yes. who is it that said I'd rather have familiar pain than unfamiliar comfort? Like yes. I, I, I would, you know, I grew up in chaos. I grew up with adrenaline and cortisol. I yeah. You know, you know, when you see people that are just like in dramatic things and you're like, how, how is that enjoyable to them? It is, it's a drug. Adrenaline turns into dopamine. It feels good. Yes. And I didn't know serenity. I didn't know calm. And, wow. you know, there was this one quote that I, um, uh, I'm going to pretend I'm smarter than I am. <laughs> Flo, does Athena want to look this up? Flaubert. Flaubert was a philosopher who said, be serene in your personal life so you can be violent in your work, wow. I want to say. Wow. I thought my life had to be chaotic to like be a good artist. I mm -hmm. thought I had to like, you know, for life to imitate art, your life has to be wild so that your art's wild. Like I just mm -hmm. had this really romanticized um, idea of like, I actually now know that the most successful people are the most boring fucking people that <laughs> <So true. laughs> have the most regimen. And I look at you and like, I, as I was doing some research on you, know, I'm like, of course he's been married forever and is in a really, <laughs> of course, because you cannot be on dating apps all day and be chasing women and being in acrimonious relationships and like fighting with people and throwing phones across the room and achieve what you've achieved. Mm. So I hadn't learned, I associated success with chaos. Mm. I was like, oh my God, all these like famous actors and directors, they, you know, and actresses, they have 10 husbands and they, you know, cheat on their, in their, I thought chaos was sexy and glamorous mm -hmm. and that's what success was because this is for all of you that have friends that have addiction it might not be you or it may be it could be you but that idea that you would show up that way wanting to be rescued almost like that that's a really fascinating perspective that i've never heard before that you would literally you think you were showing up that way sort of hoping for someone to rescue you is that what you're saying it was unconscious. It was not a conscious decision. It was not a thought process that I will do this to get this. It was just a behavior that came out of a need. Yeah. And uh, I only discovered what that need was. And I had that need that prompted that behavior through therapy. Wow. I discovered it. And it was through, it was through a couple of therapists. So I, 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 I got on an avenue that I made them lead me down properly. So I didn't distort myself. And uh, okay. Eliza, I'm curious from you. Yeah. Uh, there are people listening to this right now who's living with somebody like my mom did for all those years. Yeah. With someone who's struggling with some type of an addiction. So we're going to go deep just a little bit. Cause I always want, I want there to be the entertaining part of my show, but then I want people to go that really helped me that, that Roberts couple. Yeah. I didn't know it. I thought I was going to learn about this incredible actor, this incredible couple. They really changed my life. So yeah. this is a chance for you, you know, with several million people listening to this who admire you as a couple, you know, what advice would you give to somebody who might be living with someone who's a, obviously a beautiful soul, like my dad, like Eric, but has this disease or this addiction um, that's, that they're struggling with? What would your advice be to them? I think first, uh, if I could just speak really quickly to what yeah. you guys were just talking about, the thing of being rescued. Um, cause it also ties into being an actor or an artist. I think all of us, um, and it manifests in artists by what they choose to do. Um, we want to be loved for our whole self. We have this dread fear that if somebody really knew us and ask any addict and they'll talk to you about that. Any AA meeting, any Al-Anon meeting, if somebody really knew us, they'd leave. So we, I mean, like starting as a, as an infant, I mean, think about it. It's a person who changes your diapers. I mean, you want that full embrace to feel that you're fully and wholly accepted. And that's why an actor, you choose material that turns you inside out. You win Oscars for crying and falling apart and, and for killing somebody. I mean, you know, so it's, it's that thing of being, of wanting to be rescued. That's very real. It's more wanting to be seen and loved and invited in 
for all your filth and all the bad stuff. I always say to my actors when I'm coaching, stop being so polite. This is your chance. It's a big mess. Do a big, you know, make a big mess with this scene. Even if it's comedy, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, now, addiction is interesting. I have never had a sip of alcohol, um, a cup of pot, a cigarette Whoa. in my entire life, and I've never been with anybody who isn't an addict. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But she she comes from addicts. Her, yeah. Her, her parents were both brilliant, but especially her mother was, was a bit of a drinker and a... And a uh, she was a yeah she was a out of she was a benzo addict basically benzodiazepines you know prescription drugs. Yeah. Um, my dad was much more my biological dad was much more like me. He also didn't drink but was always with famous alcoholics you know um, and um, and but I think that part of that is you know there's the rescuer and the rescuee um, but you know you come to you come to lose compassion for that person. So if there are people out there who are living with an addict, um, you know, you get to a point where you're kind of, kind of like, you want to say to them, just kill yourself already. Because the <laughs> slow thing of watching this is, and you don't see that beautiful soul every single minute of every day. Well, Ask your mom, right? Yeah. And it's in there and it's buried, but you're doing all the work. Um, I do a bunch of YouTubes. They don't get the kind of views that your, yours do. Um, a series called I Hate Pot. <laughs> and I just go off on marijuana, which is a very insidious drug that really does have a, a strong effect on people if they are major users. It's not a desired effect. And I, I drag Eric into it and make him say all this stuff that he probably doesn't really feel. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, my Al Anon friends, the cheapest therapy going and the best is 12 step, of course. Really, truly. Um, you know, you put a dollar, maybe these days it's two or three dollars into the into the hat you and $5 really five is it up to five dollars okay well five dollars it's a lot cheaper than a shrink um but um you know my the father of my children who's who is to this day my best friend um he just got sober he's in his early 60s and he just and he, the only thing he ever he was like a couple of tokes of pot per day and he's a really hard worker he's a producer in our business and he decided to get sober off pot. I mean, talk about courage. I just, I'm blown away by that. Norman Lear's um, former wife, Frances, wrote a book about getting, getting sober at age 65. Um, it's never too late, but you're right. People go back and forth. Um, you know, Keaton had many, many years sober and then, you know, worshiped at the shrine of marijuana and then back off and back on. Um, there's a lot of worry involved. Um, there's a lot of, it's like you're watching somebody tumbling into making a definite mistake mm. all the time. Mm. And, um, there's a lot on Eric's website that we've both written just little pieces about that. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's, and like, who's not an addict? I'm a workaholic. I'm addicted to addicts. I'm addicted to a million things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's too bad that we kind of portion it off there. Yes. Um, it's well, just I part of reality, but you're doing good things bringing up the subject on your thing. Thank, well, thank you. I, I, I want to unpack a few things there, um, th several. So w one of the things with my dad, he said something about meetings. I just want to say to the audience that pre-COVID, my dad's in chemo also, so he can't go now. But for my dad, uh, the key was a 12-step program. And my dad's been sober 30 plus years. Oh. And still, my dad still goes to, and dad, if I'm wrong here, sorry, because he listens to the show with my mom. But I believe my dad still goes to three to five meetings a week. Wow. So fantastic. Yeah, See, that's, that's heroic to me. Yeah. Particularly when somebody has faith that maybe people around them or themselves may think, well, this is just some lack of faith you have. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if you were really strong in your faith and were a believer, how could you be depressed? Right. Do you think there's a... There's I think a, there's a huge stigma with faith and mental illness. So I really I. believe that there is. And mm -hmm. I think we pull verses out of context so to I. back that up and say, you know, if you don't be anxious about anything, pray about everything, and, mm -hmm. and God's going to take away all your fear, and you don't need to be afraid. And we pull these verses out, but it's not helpful. It's a real emotion. It's a real feeling and depression is a, actually a real physical illness it's yes. a chemical imbalance in our brain so it's not the result isn't, of not having enough faith isn't it interesting that his father and i think everyone needs to hear this his father who had leukemia correct mm -hmm. yeah. 
Nobody thought that that physical illness that Dave had was somehow connected to a lack of faith. Right. But when someone's afflicted with the illness of some form of mental illness, oftentimes we think, we'll just fight through it or mm -hmm. uh, just simply pray about it. And certainly mm -hmm. prayer helps, but also there's a, there's a medical fix that can be had right. or support for something like leukemia, a broken leg, mm -hmm. or something that's happened to you emotionally, mentally, psychologically as well. It's so important. It's not a lack of your faith. Right. So you've taken this break, back to the right. story. You've yeah. taken this break. Um, there's a diagnosis. You're wondering how you got there. Mm -hmm. He's relieved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So he battled, you know, he battled depression and anxiety. He had a lot of anxiety from April to August. He battled with depression. Mm -hmm. And I really never knew who I was going to get coming out of the bedroom, if he was going to be happy or if he was going to be sad or if he was going to be mad. The depression manifested itself in ways that I didn't expect. And we were doing everything we knew to do to get him the help he needed. He was seeing a psychiatrist every other week. He was on medication. Nice. We were seeing counselor together for two hours every single week. He took solo trips by himself to go spend time with God and pray and be in solitude. We took a two week road trip, just the two of us, which is like really hard to do when you have a house full of kids. But we were doing everything we knew to do to get him better. And by the end of July, the, doc the doctors actually thought that going back to work was the next right step for him. They thought too much time away from work would actually make his depression worse. Can we stay there for a second? Yeah. I want to make sure everybody heard this too, because I've heard some things about this. Yeah. It's important to know that he did try medication. He did. That this wasn't just some, I think sometimes people think, oh, they just, you know, they thought they were going to pray their way out of this to some extent. And of course, we're looking for God's favor. We're looking for blessing anytime we get. We're looking for grace. We're looking for relief. But this is a family that also treated this medically. Right. I'm interested. Because he had not had um, an extended period of time of being what you'd consider well, mm -hmm. were they changing the medications? Were they trying to find the right cop? Because oftentimes it takes a while to find right. the combination that's necessary for someone. And again, everybody, that's with this severe level of mental illness. We're not going right into medication because somebody's feeling a little bit down or depressed. That's not the right solution for everybody. But were they still playing with that at that time? Was he on medication when he went back to work? Yeah, so they actually diagnosed Andrew on the low end of the spectrum of depression. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was on very low dose of medication. Okay. And you know what? Medication can have a huge stigma around mm -hmm. it. And people people can blame the medication for a lot of things too. And say, well, if he wasn't taking the medication, then he wouldn't have died by suicide. And mm -hmm. medication causes this and this and this. And no one should take medication. And mm -hmm. there's not a one size fits all approach when, right. it, when it comes to mental health. And mm -hmm. sometimes medication works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it's just all gray. Can it's we not black and white. Can we stay there for a second? Because yeah. you're clearly far more of an expert on this having lived through it than I am. But what you just said is so important. Medication is not the solution in many cases. In some cases, medication makes it better. And in some cases, you have to watch this closely. The medication can make symptoms worse right. if it's the wrong medication, the wrong amounts, the wrong combination. So this area is something we're all learning about on how to treat mental illness when it's necessary. It's just almost like with a, with a torn tendon. Does this require surgery right. or does it require rehab? Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true in mental health as well. So, so And he, I'll never forget his psychiatrist telling us we know a drop in the ocean of the brain. There's mm -hmm. just so much we don't know about mm -hmm. the brain and about the mind. It's such a mystery. And that's mm -hmm. why you just have to try and figure out what works for you. And what works for you isn't going to work for me. Something different will work for me. So we have to have so much empathy and grace for people that are struggling and be okay with their decisions that they make to get help. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was seeing the psychiatrist so often was to check in and make sure, hey, how are you feeling? Are you having suicidal thoughts? Is the medication working? Do we need to try something else? Like, mm -hmm. it's very important. So you were doing all of the things it would seem that a family or an individual should right. be doing to treat this. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there was a misdiagnosis though. Right. We don't know. We'll never know. Yeah. yeah, we'll never know. And so he decides ultimately to go back to work. Right. And yeah, so he went back to work on August 1st of 2018 and hit the ground running and gave two powerful messages on mental illness. He called uh -huh. the series Hot Mess and he was mm -hmm. using his own experience with depression and anxiety as the example. Gave out the suicide hotline number, gave statistics on mental health, statistics on suicide. Like he knew all the facts. He was mm -hmm. quoting, you know, books and scripture uh -huh. and, and websites and he. He knew what he was up against and he was helping a lot of people. I mean, our church was flooded. People were sitting on the floor and they gave him a standing ovation. Yeah. They were so happy he was back and headed into the third week. He just had a really awful day. There was a trigger 
And unfortunately, the next day is when he attempted suicide. And we were completely shocked. We were completely stunned. We thought he was getting better. We thought that we were on the up and up. We thought that he was, you know, back to work. We're doing the right things. We're taking the next steps. Like, he's going to get better. And so we were shocked and rattled and completely devastated and blindsided. And he ended up in the hospital and was on life support. And the doctors ran all the necessary tests and basically said there was nothing that they could do. I'm so sorry. And the next day he went to be with Jesus. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, was there anything... Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. Was there anything the day of that you saw that you could share with people you thought was a tremendous trigger or not the specific trigger, but there was some behavior you saw within say hours prior that you would warn people that you observed that mm -hmm. they would look for or was there nothing yeah. like that? Um, anger. I'll never forget the night before Andrew was upset. We were all surrounding him. You know, we were right there. We were right there. The way that I describe his death is like a kid drowning in a swimming pool at a birthday party. Like he was surrounded, like surrounded by support and surrounded by love. And we just missed it. We were, we were, he was surrounded. But I'll never forget the night before as we were surrounding him and there for him. Um, he said, anger is fear. And he had this fear in him that started with the panic attacks and that was still in there. And I would ask him what that fear was. And he would never really be able to articulate what he was afraid of. Mm -hmm. But it was this fear. And I still don't know what the fear was, but he had this anger and his depression and anxiety would manifest itself sometimes in anger. Not all the time, mm -hmm. but definitely the day before mm -hmm. it was that. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, he had friends that stayed with him till the wee hours of the morning. We were, we were there and we were checking on him. So it was just a short period of time that he was by himself and we were helping from a distance. Yeah. Um, I'm, I have to ask you, how, how did this affect you? How did you respond when it initially yeah. happened? What, yeah. what are those moments like for, for the wife, now the widow of this 30-year-old yeah. handsome yeah. driven, articulate, blessed, favored, talented, loving father yeah. of a man. Yeah. What's it like for you in those moments? Shocked. Still mm. shocked. Um, mm. The counselors told us the shock can take like five to eight years to wear off. So mm. still shocked, completely shocked when it happened. Never mm. saw it coming. Mm. Begging God. You know, I laid in that hospital bed. I laid on the bed with him, holding him, playing some of the same songs he was playing over the summer in our bedroom and begging God and telling God and bartering with God, telling him, no, not not him, like you can use him, you can use his story, imagine how many people you can help. So I was shocked, especially because we just lost his dad. I'm like, God wouldn't allow you know him to die too. We just lost his dad a few yeah. years prior, like two lead pastors within three years, a father and a son within three years, like mm -hmm. so much loss, mm -hmm. like shocked. And I'm still shocked. I still have to pinch myself and remind myself that this is my life and this is my story and that really happened. Yeah. yeah. If you're walking around carrying something and you can't figure out why you're carrying it, there's one of these two T's you're carrying around, right? Like even for me, like I've produced all these external results in my life. Why am I always so worried? Why do I always create so much chaos? Why is it then for me, there's, you talk about triggers in the book, which we'll talk about in a second, but for me, it's like, why is it that if someone's not honest with me, it affects me so much more deeply than it does somebody else? Because when my dad would drink, maybe he wasn't really honest about where he was or what he was doing. So to me, that's a trigger for me, right? Mm -hmm. If I see someone super inebriated, like out of control, it affects me so deeply when I see mm -hmm. it because of my experience with my dad. So can you just go to the really go back just a little bit to the two T's? Cause I think this is important. Yeah. Yeah. Some people First, go, Hey, I don't, I'm pretty sure I wasn't sexually abused. I'm pretty sure, you know, no one beat me up when I was a child or anything like that. So I'm cool. I, right. think, I think people think that, right? That, totally. And, you know, Ed, first and foremost, I just want to honor you and acknowledge you because having an alcoholic parent is big T trauma. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's capital T. Yeah. And often what we have, when we have trauma, we will, one of the trauma responses, because there's so much shame wrapped up in the trauma. Yeah, and so yeah. we have a lot of different shame responses. And one of them is to deny, is to say, 
Oh, well, I wasn't beaten up. It wasn't that bad. I was straight up would do that. I'd be like, well, you know, I wasn't like living in poverty and like living through a war, you know? Okay. But I was still sexually abused as a child. You know, like, these are serious things that occur yes. and we minimize our trauma because we want to minimize the shame that we carry as a result of having experienced that trauma and never processing it. Mm -hmm. So that, the, and I minimized it so much that I literally dissociated from it, told a whole other story, created mm -hmm. a whole other world about my life that did not, that was not true. Mm -hmm. So, so whether it's big T or small T and, and, and the fact that bullying is considered small, being bullied is considered small T trauma is so crazy. Cause that's huge, right? Like that, that it takes people's lives. Uh, but I have seen so many people have been on this book tour. I've been ha having all these interviews and I'll have folks like you talking to me and they'll say, well, I don't really, you know, have trauma. And then within five minutes, she's like, but my dad was an alcoholic and my mom left us and I didn't really have a safe place to go to at home. And I'm like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like people, right, right. Don't, the, the word trauma has so much stigma because of the shame that's underneath it. Mm -hmm. And right now we're in this beautiful cracking open of this, of the culture, of the dialogue, of the lexicon that we are really open and willing to begin to talk about trauma in a way that isn't so loaded and isn't so shameful and is actually uh, really almost in many ways celebrated. My, when, 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 my, when my social media manager texted me and said, trauma is trending on TikTok. <laughs> wow. I, right? knew, I knew we were living in a different time. Mm -hmm. I knew we were living in a different time. Where are you <laughs> sitting with this now, Gabby, in all honesty? Like, mm -hmm. All the work you've done, by the way, this book's loaded with tools and we're going to touch on a couple of them, but I also want you guys to get the book. So we'll touch on a few of them. But like, as you sit there this morning, you know, how would you describe your state of being now? I am so proud of who I am right now. I, I'll tell you why. Yeah. At 36, when I remembered this trauma, I, I knew right then and there, I need to write a book about this. I need to, to do this, but there's no way in hell that I could put that book and that pen to paper until I had lived through the journey of undoing yes. and returning to that place of peace. Mm -hmm. I put my face on this book cover ad. It, the subtitle is the guided path from trauma to profound freedom and inner peace. It would be really, really dangerous for me to put my face on that cover and my name on that cover if I couldn't really stand behind that promise. Mm -hmm. So as a result of living the practices that we'll touch on, as a result of living through to come through the other side, and, if, and frankly, there was times where I didn't know that there was a way out, mm -hmm. but I was committed and, and, and on a mission. Mm -hmm. And now, where am I now? I definitely am living with profound freedom and inner peace. Does that mean that I wasn't totally effing triggered about 13 minutes ago before we started this podcast? Is that right? No, but here's the miracle. I'm on a <laughs> call. So awesome that you admit that. <laughs> like so freaking triggered. Okay, so I'm on a call and the dynamic of my, you know, I, I, I work very closely with people who are very close to me. And when you, you know, the intimate relationships in your life are going to trigger you the most. So I'm on this call and my old triggers are just really there. Yeah. But the beauty is, is that today as a result of particularly one of the therapies I talk about in the book, internal family systems therapy, which I've now been trained in IFS is about really respecting all the parts of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so rather than letting that triggered part, that controller, right. That feels like she's being shut down. So she needs to so the shutdown, the, the girl who's being silenced, right. Has this protector part and the protector parts is controlling control freak. That's like, no, let me scream louder than everybody else. Let me make sure I'm known and heard, make sure I'm the boss, blah, blah, blah. And I've set up a world that really, it really works for that part. Right. It facilitates that. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. so I'm in that moment and I'm feeling that part come up the controller that wants to protect me from this feeling of not being seen. Mm. And instead of screaming louder and instead of pushing, I muted my zoom. Because I'm like, well, even if I try to talk, they can't hear me. <laughs> and I sat with the frustration mm. and I, and I let myself be present with the part of me that was so activated. 
Mm-hmm. And I noticed it in my body. And I was like, this, I'm boiling. My face is red. Mm-hmm. I'm so like heightened right now. I want to punch the screen. Mm-hmm. And I asked myself, like, what do I know? I did all this in real time. Like, what do I know about this? This is, this is the part that feels like she's not being heard. She's not being seen. Mm-hmm. And what does she need? She needs to very calmly ask the team to not put these kinds of calls in the middle of a day when she needs to be creative mm-hmm. and to give her more space to ideate and not force her into a decision in the way that they want. Yes. That's so good. And I did that. I did that. I was still triggered and I was still in that place, but I was grounded enough to say, Hey guys, I need it this way. You know, this is really, this is, I don't even, even able to say like, this is very activating for me Mm. and I'm feeling um, really frustrated at this time. And I would really like the space to be able to do this creative work in a different way. That's so beautiful. Wow. And you know, and then I got on the phone with my producer and had a quick cry. And then I got on with you. <laughs> yeah. You're showing up like full out here. So I, I really appreciate it. I love your, we're a lot alike. Like I, 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 uh, I like to kind of show my fragility sometimes, well, all the time when I do, because I don't need to be someone's, you know, icon. I want people to believe that if I can change, they can change. Right. Oh, and, yeah. And you see, so you talk about the IFS therapy in the book. There's so many things like this too, but you touched on this trigger thing and then your pattern. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about triggers and patterns. Cause I think even that terminology may be new to most people, yeah. right? People that have been in therapy, they're probably familiar with that. Or even if they know how to, they read some of my stuff on changing their state and being a peak performer, they know how to create a trigger and patterns. But do you feel like, so discuss that for a second, but do you feel like also like just being aware of the pattern, like what you just said, like, all right, I'm doing it again that to some extent, the awareness of the pattern can help it lose its power and grip over you. Absolutely. And actually, that's actually one of the first, ex- that is the first exercise yep. in the book, which yep. is really about witnessing your triggers. How do you feel? And then what are you doing to run from them? Mm-hmm. What that's doing is in IFS language, internal family systems therapy. It's nothing to do with family therapy, although it kind of comes from that core, core model, but it is based on your inner family. Inside of us, we have multiple different parts. Mm. So we have these child parts, the little boy, Ed, whose dad was an alcoholic and wasn't telling the truth and you know whatever the, the storyline is. Mm-hmm. Those little exiled parts, the little boy, he's locked up. He's like under lock and key. You know, he's there, but he's like real down there in the dungeon. You know, we're not talking to him, lock him up. Yeah. And then we've got all these protector parts I'll speak for my own, right? My, yeah. my little girl, she's locked up in the little girl that was abused. She's locked up. But my protector parts are the controller, the cocaine addict, right? Even though I'm in recovery, that addict part is present. Uh, the the out, knives out is one that I call. Yeah. The, the outraged part of me that wants to be like, you mess with me, you mess with death row. Like I am going to come after you. And so all these parts are very extreme and they're very protective. And often you might consider them bad habits, you might be looking at it and say, oh, that's my, my, you know, my, the, the, the part of me that's, that wants to go pick up a drink because I can't feel that. Or the part of me that just wants to zone out and freeze because I can't handle this, you know? Mm-hmm. So we have all these different protect and protective mechanisms, but they're really yes. in IFS called protective protector parts. Yeah. The, they're not bad. These parts are very valuable. They have had a very important role in our inner system. And the role is to keep us safe from the extreme terror, shame, and fear of these exiled child parts. Here's the secret people ask me, what's the number one thing that surprised you that all your guests have in common that are on your show? Oh, it's, it's, it, it, it's the mental health it aspect, is. right? Yeah. And they, I, I'll say one is, that obviously I knew they were obsessed and worked hard. The thing that surprised me is the percentage of them to some extent that still struggle with finding happiness, with finding peace, with mental health issues. Like that's the part that surprised me the most. I thought, well, and I should have known better, but these mega achievers, they found happiness automatically because they've achieved things. And that's not always the case. So would you share a little bit about when you were playing and just overall struggles you've had with just happiness, mental health in general? Well, it was interesting because in 2010, you know, after we won this World Series, mm-hmm. um, I'm literally waking up the next day next to my wife at the time. Okay. And I look her dead in the eyes. We're rolling over, waking up. And she's like, wow, you got to be so proud. You got to be amazing. And I looked her dead in the eye and I go, huh, now what? 
Mm. I was 35 years old. I had accomplished everything I'd ever wanted in my life. I won a World Series, made millions of dollars, beautiful wife, kids, all the toys, the gadgets, but deep down inside, I was still uns unfulfilled. I chased a dream for my whole life and now it's achieved, and now what? Mm. So there was this, that identity of what I'm yes. chasing anymore was gone. Yes. And so after that moment, I, I went on a bender of Adderall, mm -hmm. booze, just to try and f to, to numb that pain mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I ended up in rehab mm -hmm. in 2010. Where the same year you win the World Series. That, that off season. Where okay. there's kids in there that are 15 years old with needles in their arms. And mm -hmm. I mean, people with really a lot of problems. I didn't think I had a problem, but mm -hmm. I knew I needed some help. And so I was masking a lot of internal pain. I had mm -hmm. everything. Right, everything, and so it was a right from then. After I won that World Series, I retired in 2012. Mm. Interestingly enough, we won the World Series in 2012. Yeah, but that whole season, I was a ghost. Mm. I was uh, having anxiety attacks every single day in the clubhouse. Mm. I couldn't play. I was put on the 60-day DL. Mm. I was basically staying home on road trips because I couldn't travel. I couldn't Remember get on an airplane. Didn't you have one event? If you don't mind me interrupting, was the first big one. You Absolutely. literally took off. It was right? 2011. I'm in New York. It mm -hmm. was about three in the morning, and uh, I had to go to the bathroom. Went to go take a piss, you know, mm -hmm. come back out, and the room started shrinking in on me. Mm -hmm. My heart started racing. It felt like I, my, I was sweating, but yet I was freezing. Mm -hmm. It was weird. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh. Oh, I, I just went on a, probably had 12 beers that night and 15 yeah. shots too. So right. I probably didn't help my situation. Sure, sure. And uh, so the room's closing in. I'm like, oh gosh, I think I'm having a heart attack. That's the first thing that went sure. in my mind. No way I'm going to die in this hotel room. Mm -hmm. It's three in the morning. We're in New York, and I'm packing my bag. Right then and there, I'm zip it up and I just go. Full, full from the clothes I had on the night before, smelling like booze and mm. just gross. Mm. Get in the cab, go to the airport, and I'm literally getting a ticket to Tampa to go see my family. Now, as I'm going through this, I'm still freaking out. Mm. Heart's racing, I'm dripping sweat. The lady at the counter's like, you okay, sir? I'm like, mm. yeah, I think so, I think so. Just trying to get through it. Yeah. I'm at the gate waiting <clears throat> to get on, <clears throat> excuse me, mm. get on the plane. And I'm sitting there with my feet up on the wall, on the ground, trying to maintain some kind of, you know, calmness. Couldn't do it. And as I boarded the plane, the door slammed and it went into overdrive. And now I'm like white knuckling on the seats. We're not even moving yet. And I'm like, how do I get off this plane? How do I get off this plane? And as we start to land um, in Tampa, finally, with a jacket over my, all the air jumping on me. I mean, I had to calm down some way. Mm. I see the sun come up in Tampa as I'm about to land. I started calming down and I was like, what the hell was that? Wow. Had no clue. I land there and my, my, my wife was like, what are you doing here? Mm. And I had to call the team and say, hey, I don't know what happened, family emergency, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of lied about it. Yeah. The next day, I'm packing to go back to Cincinnati where they're going for the next trip. And as I'm packing my bag, it was happening again. Man. And I'm like, okay, I'm staying. So I call my trainers, they put me into a, um, um, with a therapist. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder, the mm -hmm. whole deal. And from that moment on, it was like a, that I was a ghost the rest of my career. The rest of your career. Yeah. This is, uh, by the way, it takes a strong man to share this. Yeah. And I know you shared it before, but not maybe. It's never to, easy. Yeah, and, and to an audience this large too. And, and um, I really respect that. And I, I think that, you know, everybody, when there's these issues that you have in your life that are there, I asked you off camera, did you have this anxiety just that first time? He said, no, it was always sort of there, but right. it, it just sort of eventually reared its head big time. And so, you know, everybody, if your identity is tied up in, I, I've done podcasts on this, but if your identity is tied up in your money, your relationship, your achievements, your body, these other things, if you link your identity to these things, you're, you have to eventually just love you. You have to care for you. You have to become at some kind of peace with you these external things eventually wear out in your identity. I'm curious though, um, you had the Adderall thing going pretty good there for a while. Yeah. And it led to an event, I, I, I just want everyone to hear this because I think most people listening to this, I think most people struggle with happiness. And so that could be caused all the way to what we want to call full-blown depression, to anxiety, to just they're down, they're lethargic, they're melancholy, they're frustrated, they're scared. There's all these negative mental emotions we all have. They're worried. I suffer from all of them at some time mm -hmm. or another. But for you, this thing kind of got worse and worse and worse till you found yourself at one point and you'd retired. Yeah, you so might I was yeah, I was retired. We just won the World Series in 2012. Yeah. We swept the Tigers in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I didn't play one at bat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was basically done. Mm -hmm. And so I walked off that field that day. I'm done. I'm gonna mm -hmm. raise my kids who at the time were four and two, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna ride off in the sunset. Anxiety, depression's gone. Go I'm gonna away. 
enjoy the fruits of my labor. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that easy, man. I got mm -hmm. out and uh, for the next two years, I was sporadically having panic attacks and, and mm -hmm. just kept going and kept going. And then, with along with the panic attacks, depression started sitting in. Mm -hmm. I would have, waiting for that daily panic attack during the day, there was a moment where there was a time in my life where I couldn't get on my bike to go ride it around on the beach because I was afraid to get a panic attack on my bike. Oh my gosh. Um, I've called the ambulance three times mm -hmm. to come pick me up to check me out to see because I thought I was dying. Wow. Um, and then as the night, days would go and I'd have my daily panic attack, I'd find myself in the closet every day, wow. just depressed, like staring at the mirror, mm -hmm. which is interesting because in 2014, I'd had enough. I've mm -hmm. been two years out of the game and my wife was cooking dinner in the kitchen in mm -hmm. San Diego. I was cutting vegetables, my kids were playing Legos, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, here goes that heart racing, and here comes that panic attack. I'm like, ah, I'd had enough. Mm -hmm. So I retreated in my room, um, I, I went to my closet, and in my closet I have a safe, I hit the code, I pulled out my gun. And at the time I was wearing a wife beater, I had the shaved head, the goatee, the tattoos, mm -hmm. I looked like a tough son of a bitch, but I was scared to death inside, right? Mm -hmm. And I had this full length mirror in my closet and I'd hit my knees with that gun in my hand and I was desperate, man. I was tired of feeling that way. Um, I pulled the hammer back and I put it here and I'm looking right in that mirror and I'm crying. Just crying, all I have to do is pull it and it'd be all over with. And it was in that moment where I was thinking to myself as I'm looking at that gun in the mirror that I freaked out, put it down. That same 357 Magnum I had in my hand, my dad was murdered by. That same caliber weapon. And so, man, talk about full circle in life. It was, let, it was like a godly universal wake up call. It's like, hold, hold on, dude. Yeah. You know, this is not gonna be easy. You're gonna have to battle, but you're gonna get through this. Oh my so I put that, that uh, gun down, I, I said a prayer to God, and mm -hmm. from that moment on, it took some time. And mm -hmm. I think that's what people need to know mm -hmm. when they're going through anxiety and depression. It doesn't happen overnight, mm -hmm. right? There's certain steps I had to take. Mm -hmm. It probably took about two good years for me to really get to the point in my life where I'm comfortable sharing these things with people. Sure. Um, because there was times when I would try and talk about it, and I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. But I think for me to heal was diet, it was exercise, it was taking care of how I, uh, myself from drinking aspect, kind of cut down mm -hmm. on that. Obviously the pills were gone, but I think more importantly anything is that the ability to be vulnerable enough mm -hmm. to go out there and tell people about it and talk about it because mm -hmm. when you talk about these things mm -hmm. it no longer holds power over you and so once i was able to say you know what this does not scare me it does not shame me anymore mm -hmm. for the people out there that are driving listening to this dude if you're struggling with this and you don't let anybody know it's going to eat you alive mm -hmm. you got to let it out mm -hmm. you've got to talk about it and you got to be vulnerable with it mm -hmm. to the people you love the most your mm -hmm. wife and kids and I, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I got divorced last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And a lot of it was not because of my wife. It was because of my issues that I've had was mm -hmm. so bad. Yep. It was hard for her to get over. Let's was, stay on there for a second. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful for you, bro. Thanks, bro. Because uh, you're helping, a, you're helping millions of people. And I want everyone to picture this again. You've got millions of dollars in the bank. Yep. Beautiful family. And you're set for the rest of your life. Great home. You can do whatever you want all day long. And this is what I want everybody to hear. You think your job's stressing you, or you think it's the person in your life that's stressing you, but what happens is we get go-to emotions in our life that we've been addicted to. If one of your emotions is anxiety or stress or fear, the thing you're using right now to give you that emotion may be your career, like you were in baseball. Mm -hmm. It may be another person. But you think, well, if I switch careers or I switch the person, I'll lose that addiction to the emotion. You don't. You mm -hmm. find another place to generate the same emotion. So it may move from your career to a person, to your money. So the, the thing to be aware of is that you're addicted to that emotion. You're addicted to what, how that makes you feel. There's a pattern you're running. So the anxiety wasn't just your career, because you took the career away, the anxiety was still there. Right. The depression was still there. This is a powerful thing for everybody to understand. The second thing I'd ask you though, so I want, I want you to be aware of that. I agree with you that the awareness and the talking about it helps it lose a lot of its power over you. And ask for help. Talk to people. Mental health, everybody, has become something that is not this taboo thing anymore, okay? It's just like, ha it, it, mental health is the same as you've got an injured knee, an injured back, an injured, it's an injury to you. It's something that if you talk about and get help, you can heal. And so I wanna, and by the way, some of you that think that, well, I'm using medications or alcohol, okay? Oftentimes, those are masking agents, and I just want everybody to understand this. When you remove that drug or that alcohol, Sometimes this monster that's hurting you is bigger now because the masking is gone and you're gonna to need to deal with it eventually. So 
Could you take them through a couple other things? If you were given, someone's listening saying, I'm somewhere from totally depressed with the 357 at my head mm -hmm. to I'm just bummed out a lot and I'm not happy. What were some of the steps you did take talking about it, sharing with other people? Was there something you did, therapy, faith, you said diet, anything you'd share well, specifically? I think the, one, the one thing that I did right out of the gate, first and foremost, was I would wake up in the morning early before everybody got up, before mm -hmm. the kids got up and the craziness of my day started. Mm -hmm. And I'd give myself an hour to, uh, whether it's reading the Bible or, or reading a, a self-help book of mm -hmm. some sort, just to get my mind in a positive frame right out of the gate in the morning. Okay. Um, you know, I, then I would get my kids off to school um, you know, my wife at the time would go do what she does, and, mm -hmm. and then I would go to the gym. And okay. I, at the time, I was watching so many YouTube videos on motivation. I wish I, I saw you back in the day. I would have put you on there. But, uh, okay. So I had all these YouTube videos that were like downloaded on like a MP3 in my, you mm -hmm. know, so I could listen to it while I worked out. I wouldn't even listen to music. Mm -hmm. I was listening to positive, encouraging, mm -hmm. uh, motivating talks with mm -hmm. a little inspirational background music mm -hmm. with guys like, uh, you know, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, sure. your boy. And uh, guys like that, and I would just work out as I'm rewiring my brain with the endorphins naturally from working out. Yes. And that positive, uh, that positive talk is going on in my head all the time. Mm. And um, along with diet, and so I, I went on this incredible just like journey of the ne last next two years. Mm. But I will say this: mm -hmm. the depression was there at times. Mm -hmm. The anxiety was still there at times. The panic attacks were getting less and less and less. Okay. Uh, it wasn't daily. Mm -hmm. They started gradually going down. Um, even today. I still have anxiety. Sure. I'm sure as you do too. I do. But it, it does not overtake my life anymore. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is so many people think that, you know what, I shouldn't ever have anxiety. I shouldn't ever mm -hmm. have depression. But we all have seasons of it. Absolutely. And it's okay to accept it and say it's not, it's just a season of my life. So well and it's, said. And it's not going to control my life.